All right, time. Um, let's get started. So, for this session, we'll talk a bit about um, improvements we can make to our testing infrastructure. Um, we can start off with um, the the infrastructure that's used for um, unit tests, make check, make the API tests uh, uh, through GitHub and, and Jenkins. Looks like um, we've got uh, David Galloway at least for a few minutes here. So, David, um, I, I, we had a few ideas I was talking about with Kifu um, about how we could potentially improve some of the reliability of the um, Jenkins jobs and, and uh, builders. And um, in, in the Etherpad here, there's a few things that maybe uh, be interested in your thoughts about. Um, one one aspect there is um, so a lot of times when we have uh, race conditions in in Jenkins and uh, make check tests in particular that can cause some instability, be difficult to, to de debug these since we don't have um, very robust logging enabled, and the logs tend to go away pretty fast. Is there um, a way that we could potentially store those logs uh, longer or in more detail? Um, yeah, prob probably. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there's a number of different ways we could do that. We could we could store them on the long running cluster if space is a concern. Mm -hmm. um, we there's uh, every job has like a, a maximum number of um, jobs to keep, and we could increase that as well. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of different ways we could accomplish that. Okay, good. I think that would really help with the um, debugging aspect. Um, another aspect was uh, just when we're making changes to the Jenkins infrastructure, like the upgrading the test nodes or adding new patch packages. Um, seems like sometimes it, this, can, this can cause some impacts to the existing um, setup. Um, so I was kind of wondering if, if we could set up some kind of like staging environment where we could ro roll these, these kinds of changes out um, and, and test them more extensively before putting them into the main Jenkins rotation. Um, yeah, th I mean, that's that's sort of what the Ceph-build-pull-requests <laughs> job is supposed to do, but um, that obviously doesn't doesn't test every single job on every single distro um mm -hmm. so and i i just i don't i don't think that's very realistic to do just for um ci pull requests uh but mm -hmm. yeah i mean we we could we could probably um look into a couple different ways we could spin up just a, a quick ephemeral jenkins instance and join a jenkins builder to it maybe run make check or yeah, it's doable. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think we can probably iron out more more details there. But like sometimes we've seen like th like things that uh, merge that uh, work on master but not stable branches. So, um, or or things that uh, that that have changed in the distro itself, perhaps that that, that has some breakage. So maybe we can talk more um, later and figure out that kind of. What, what the different aspects we want to test are and how we can, uh, what, we're, what we're missing, basically. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see, uh, Kifu had a couple other ideas that I think would, would help out here as well um, about uh, trying to like label PRs that are important for fixing um, build or test setups that we could easily tell which ones those are and, and, and um, prioritize reviewing them. Things do break. I think sometimes it's been uh, uh, like that. Uh, we, we kind of talk in our NSCP channel or IRC about these things, uh, but sometimes it's uh, tricky to tell uh, what, what's the um, most important PR to, to or, or, or fix it as it's already out there. Yeah, I think one thing that I, I think will be useful um, 
Can you guys hear me? I think my microphone is... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think uh, oftentimes uh, what uh, personally I felt is um, I suddenly wake up one day and I see all make check is failing and it's very hard to figure out what changed or where things changed. So if there are, you know, changes uh, that are going to affect um, things like make check uh, on several branches or like let us say make check on Nautilus, such kind of PRs or such kind of uh, changes, maybe uh, we could send an email uh, uh, on like the Stepia group or something that, okay, such and such thing much, please look out for some, you know, failures in the next 24 hours or 12 hours. Um, that at least gives us, you know, let us say we have to do a release. Uh, we at least know what to revert and, you know, what, what, ne what the next steps are instead of hunting all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Emails to CPA would help too. And the other related aspect is like um, when we see something, uh, when we see a make check failure, how do we start debugging things? At the moment, we do have Jenkins uh, log, uh, but that, in my opinion, we have, that also is not super obvious where things are failing or there are multiple errors you'd see. It's hard to figure out which one is really causing an issue. So making yes. that a little easy to debug for any normal person would be... <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, to be honest, today you have you need specialized <laughs> to look through those logs. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not incredibly intuitive. Um, even, even for me, I don't, I don't love it. So I get it. Yeah, Keith had an idea there, at least for the make check um, test, where a C test has an emoji, it can output machine readable information, um, that, so we could actually tell exactly which like individual. Um, test that's running failed um, and, and report that back to GitHub so we could at least see those kinds of tests more easily. Yeah, that um, that sounds interesting. I, I don't I don't fully know what uh, ctest does, but it, it sounds like that's that would be pretty easy to do based on my very brief understanding. Yeah, I think I think it would be relatively simple. Um, Another thing that might be nice um, would be maybe including more. I mean, at least to me, it's, it's not always obvious what the what kind of um, the metadata is about, like the machine that the job is run, is running on. And sometimes mm -hmm. that can be pretty important. Mm -hmm. Like if it's only only failing on a particular distro or a certain type of machine for some reason, or, or even the same like a single builder that's uh, gotten into a bad state. Yeah. Another um, idea that Keith had with respect to um, uh, recent tests um, was that uh, we, we do have some like known race conditions that have been quite difficult to debug. And um, for those things that we can't, haven't been able to fix, uh, perhaps we could have like a some some kind of list of them that Jenkins could um, could know could know about in, in as, as like a file in the repository, some regex to grep or in the failure, so that it, it could automatically uh, rerun those fail jobs if they hit that same exact bug, without having to kick off a whole new build and and uh, test cycle for everything. Yeah, I'm sure they're probably. I mean, I I know we have a plugin installed that you can sort of you can you can put in um, regular expressions and then have it. Uh, Rep for those in in the in the build log, and then it will say that on the main job page that that was why it failed. Um, which mm -hmm. which is nice if if you're okay going through the Jenkins web UI to to go look at that. Um, 
but I mean, you know, that's just that's just for human consumption too. So it would be nice for sure to tie that into like a I'm sure there's another plugin that we would have to install to rerun based on that, but I'm sure it's probably doable as well. Yeah, no, yeah, I'm not even sure if it needs to be a Jenkins plugin. Like it could be something that's integrated into like the make check itself or the API mm, test yeah. itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if it, if it seems like it makes more sense to include that in the test. Like if the test is gonna if it's a known racy test, then the test will just repeat itself up to n times. Yeah, yeah. I like I like that idea better than another plugin. Um, I do need to Definitely. run today. <laughs> I need to run though. Okay, thanks, David. Yeah, we can talk in more detail later. Yep, no for problem. sure. All right, take care, guys. Uh, okay. Just to be, I. Oh, sorry, just, I don't know if there is such a thing for, um, uh, well, actually in, in the dashboard, we are running the Cypress and we, for example, may, but this, this, uh, this is mostly for end-to-end -end test. I don't think it's uh, for other kinds of testing, but it also flags the tests that are flaky. So uh, based on the runs and the branches, it also takes into account the branches because right now in, I think in Jenkins, it sees all the peers as in a linear way, so there is no way to see if there is a flaky test in Nautilus or in master. It mixes everything, so if there is actually a flapping test in master, but there is a, that, that test succeeds later in Nautilus, I think there is no way, it's a way for, for Jenkins to flag that, that test as a flaky one. I'm not sure if we can you know, make a distinction in, in Jenkins so it can uh, kind of cluster the, the failures uh, based on the ranches or something rather than the current approach, which is uh, like, yeah, everything in a single uh, timeline and it's hard to, to identify a flapping test or test with uh, more flakiness. Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't seen Cypress before. It looks like a very useful tool. What's what's uh, So what's required for like the, uh, Jenkins output to be to be able to be useful used by Cypress. I don't think this is directly usable because the whole Cypress thing is, is like a I mean a built-in thing just for end-to-end -end testing. So you just install the an, uh, JavaScript library. It runs a, a web driver. So it's very focused for for end-to-end -end testing. I, I mean I would okay. be surprised okay. if there would be such a thing for for Jenkins or another kind of dashboard for, for tracking test. In any case, this recent uh, X unit or J unit uh, uh, change that Kifu did, I think, is not uh, tracking the, the the failure of a specific test, so we can get the. Well, I think you already mentioned that, right? You just get the stack trace of every test, so it helps you identify where the failure is. The only thing is that if you have a look at the uh, main page of the, uh, let me share that. For example, the pull request uh, job. Uh, there is a graph there, and that graph basically mixes the. There is different number of tests based on the different branches, so that's not very useful. Hard to see if there's a, a specific test that is failing more often, or but perhaps if we can, I mean, split that in into branches, that that might be more useful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's probably something worth looking into then if there are other other kinds of Jenkins plugins that could make this easier to, for us to track. Uh, one question, Josh. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, well, I think it was in the Rados uh, meeting that I mentioned it, but uh, um, I don't know if this tracks somehow the the ability to allocate some machine resources for stress testing or scale or performance as you, you want to call it mm -hmm. in order to identify what all next uh, I think all components can benefit from you know, not the dashboard I mean uh, the idea was just for example to set up a cluster with 1000 OSD, 1000 RBDs, 20,000 buckets and try to do the usual operations, retrieving buckets from dashboard or for a, from API uh, to identify with the stress testing, this I think would be great. So I don't know if, uh, well, I don't know if David should be aware of it or. or... Yeah, I mean, for, for um, 
I think we we talked about this a little bit in the previous um, session, but I think for like the higher level testing of, of like the manager modules and dashboard and things that aren't, aren't directly um, necessarily consuming the storage, but we are, are wanting to stress things more around the scale. We can um, it, it probably makes sense to simulate a lot of those th things rather than trying to build like a thousand node cluster in the lab itself. Like like having a, a fake a way to inject uh, fake data for the manager to I think that there's like a thousand hosts and, and tens of thousands of OSDs and like millions of RBD images. Um, I think that would be really useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we can implement some, I mean, stress framework that uh, do fake things, but mm -hmm. the, the thing is to identify these kind of things, but uh, as currently we don't have a, a, a lab for this uh, upstream wise, so if there is a possibility to allocate some machines for it, uh, uh. yeah, we, we did tell. Um, we have discussed in the past a little bit about like a performance CI where we and where we might we kind of have a dedicated set of machines that um, we'd use to run more performance-based tests in Jenkins. Um, we actually have the some of the uh, Jenkins perf job already that runs some Crimson tests today. Um, I think the difficulty there is that um, we haven't found it to be a very uh, low variance. Like it's been, if you run the same job test um, many times, the, the variance in results is fairly high. So you can like, det detect uh, performance issues at a very coarse layer level. If you say you got like a 50% or 100% reg regression in performance, but um, for, for kind of finer grained testing, uh, I think it would need to be more investigation into how the hardware is set up and how the systems are configured to make that more uh, consistent. Okay, so what should be the first step here, or if it's the first action item here? So I think like the, the fake data simulation seems like it's uh, quite useful uh, regardless of the um, machine setup. So that, that, that sounds quite, quite helpful to me. Um, in terms of uh, other kinds of stress testing, uh, perhaps you could take a look at the existing like Crimson performance job and see how, how it's uh, running things. I think, it's, I think it's basically running things off of a VSphere cluster, similar to the other jobs. Um, perhaps you could we could add uh, other kinds of uh, performance tests there, at least ones that don't require a large scale. Mm -hmm. We also have the um, performance suite in uh, the rate uh, in technology, um, which runs on a, a few nodes, so. More than more than a single node at uh, scale, at least. Uh, just take and right, it's been running for a few years now. I think they had, had this um, maybe back in 2017, 2018. Uh, so to people be able to at least uh, collect data about how uh, how we're doing over time. It, it's also not the most consistent since it is running on uh, different nodes each time. But it, it's another uh, area where we, we could potentially improve and perhaps try try to run it on like the same set of nodes to make things more consistent and expand that uh, to include more kinds of uh, performance tests as well. Uh, that, that performance should um, have some kind of profiling so you can find out the bottlenecks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, profiling is a, a, bit, a little bit of a separate thing, um, but the, it uses the um, the stuff benchmarking tool or CBT framework to mm -hmm. collect a lot of information while the tests are running, like about the resource utilization in terms of memory, CPU, uh, network. Um, so that gives you a kind of a general core screen idea of um, where, where your bottlenecks could be, and TPT has has, a, has a, a, the ability to enable um, like more complete profiling, like, like running like running perf or or, or um, like Mark and Adam have a, a, like a different versions of uh, 
GDP, uh, GDB based pro, um, sampling profiler that, that can be used to get more detailed information. So we, we could add, add things like that to those suites as well. Okay. okay. In general, uh, uh, if we want to add more instrumentation or more ways to gather in, uh, data, like, like C, uh, CBT is a great, great place to do it since it's easily run against a, any cluster. You could run it against like vstart or an existing cluster you have set up already, or it can set up its own cluster for you. So if we add, add, add the support for more tooling there, if, if we need it, then we can use it anywhere pretty much. Um, are there other, other ideas that uh, folks want to discuss around uh, Jenkins or uh, make check or API tests? This, I'm not sure if this falls into this category, but we've we talked before about um, streamlining the backboards process. It feels like there's a bunch of like small GitHub Actions integrations that we can do that would automate a lot of the backboards. Stuff. Maybe that's different than it might be unrelated, I guess. But uh, that's a little bit different. But we could talk about it. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time. So, what, what kinds of things do you have in mind? Um, when you open, well, I guess sort of from the going in reverse direction. If you merge a PR that references a backport tracker, it should mark that tracker resolved and update the um the uh whatever the parent tracker if all of the backports are resolved like it could just bubble up so you don't have to go fiddling with the tracker when you merge things um i thought the scripts already did that um like not immediately in response to an if the merge but um when you run them after the fact oh really i didn't know that i always go and do it manually but they do it automatically that'd be great um trackable trackers but not resolve what was that now missed the first part i said i said i've seen it create a, a backboard tracker tickets but not resolve them i thought it was automatically able to resolve them too uh, uh, i don't think so i think if you move a tracker to uh in its backport then for each of the branches it creates uh a backboard tracker, but that, that that's all. Even I have seen that uh, recently. It it doesn't mark it uh, resolved automatically. I will I have to do it manually, move it to resolve state. Okay. So the is the the backport trackers are automatically created if you change to needs backport. Do you know how often? Yeah, pen, pen, pending backport. Uh, if you mark any. Backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe this topic would be, would uh, be better with uh, Nathan Cutler or other folks who are yeah. more familiar with the backward yeah. machine. Community. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I think this was Patrick's uh, who did it. I think he mentioned that there is a bot, uh, the backboard bot, and I think he did that. But it's based on the backboard in the script, so it's another automation, not in not GitHub, not Jenkins. It's uh, I'm not sure wh wh where is that running. I think it's just Redmine based at the moment, but I'm, I'm pretty sure there'll be a way to uh, configure it to run, you know, you know, lower frequency, higher frequency, whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's at least two scripts. There's one that creates issues. There's one that resolves issues. Um, I'm not sure what else they do. But I think Nathan and Patrick could probably tell us more. Yeah, okay. Back to it later then. Okay. Um, so the next uh, next things I wanted to talk about were then were a bit more about the integration tests and improvements we've got planned and and uh, some of the 
uh, other changes we could make there for Quincy. Um, so the first major one um, is in the way we're uh, handling the queuing and uh, of uh, jobs through the technology. So HRI is already looking at this, uh, moving the queue uh, out of Beanstalk and into the panels database. Um, Ashray, if you're on here, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think the main things that we need to take care of um, moving from Beanstalk to Paddles is the priority logic, because currently when we add a job to the Beanstalk queue, it's a priority queue, so it just takes in the priority field and uh, takes care of everything internally. So um, now we will be implementing the priority logic so we can talk about um, what we might want that to be. Yeah, they don't have a good sense of what the uh, scheduling algorithm should be in the future. I think we might need to take a look at like the, how the lab does over, um, over time now that we're out of the um, Pacific uh, release zone. Seems like there's a, it's a bit less busy, so there's a little bit less pressure on the lab. I would guess that the initial implementation could just be a strict priority queue, though, right? Just like the the oldest, lowest priority item. Go from there. Okay. Yeah, just matching the existing setup to start with. My my sense is that having like automatic priority changes or something based on um, age or something like that will be less important if you can change the priority of an existing run. Like if you see something that's if you can do it manually, yeah, if you can go log in and just click and say change priority. Yeah, we could add something like that to Paddle Server to change the priority. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would certainly be a lot easier than uh, canceling and requeuing things. Yes. It is what you have to do today. So I guess um, going along with that, um, we're probably going to need to make more changes to paddles. I uh, wanted to um, talk about making the um, ability to, to deploy the changes to paddles easier, because right now we uh, end up having to drain the queue and um, basically pause running jobs as much as we can so that they don't hit errors when paddles is down momentarily or restarting it. Um, I think that perhaps we could just set up a proxy in front of it, run two panel services, active, passive, and just restart one of them at a time so that we always have access to the, um, the service in general. And we don't need to pause anything. I don't, I don't see any issues that should actually cause, but uh, we, we, I guess we can see how, it, how, that, how that works. Does the HA proxy active passive mode? If you have a single request that comes through and it goes to a server that is then down, does HA proxy resubmit it so that you get no failures, or is it sort of a? I'm not sure. And ideally, like since this is something we we only worry about like when like we're manually restarting or something, uh, we should in theory be able to say like uh, switch to this server as the active one and, and kill yeah. the, uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I guess I wonder if um, this can be fixed on the, the client side also, though. Like, I don't know how many places in the 2000s yeah. are called paddles, but if they could just retry. I, I already added retries to all the right paths. Uh, I think we need to add them to the read paths, too, because of the interesting issue that we're seeing with them. I think you filed a bug about this, but we've been seeing this um, intermittently now. Um, it's caused by the paddles uh, worker uh, process timing out and then uh, getting restarted. So it's getting hung somewhere. Um, so we can certainly add retries on the technology side to work around that. But I think we also need some more logging in paddles to yeah. understand what's happening. Yep. Okay. And then and, um, within Palpito, the uh, UI for paddles, um, I guess a bunch of things that we can do once uh, Junior's PR adding authentication is merged. 
like that. And as well, we can like add things like reprioritizing um, names in the queue, be able to see what's in the queue. Um, once it, uh, once it, once the actuary has got it into the database instead of um, only in Beanstalk, because right now uh, I was, I have no idea about that priority of different jobs. We can also do a lot more things in the UI, like um, uh, more more add more filtering when you're looking at uh, test result runs, so you can uh, narrow down to specific uh, areas you're interested in. Um, be able to see what's in the queue more easily, like what 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 uh, runs are scheduled by different priority and different users, and just doing that general um, job management there too, like being able to cancel runs or um, kill the ones that are already already going that are uh, have some problem you don't care about it uh, looking at anymore, or maybe your old old scheduled jobs that don't matter. In terms of uh, technology itself, um, one of the ongoing things is, is, is to propagating more of this FADM-based testing across the suites. Um, Harish um, has a PR for our RV suite that, that covers almost everything there, converting it to FADM. Uh, I think there's, there's already been work with the RPD, or, or the RGW and CFS suites to get those working too. I'm not sure exactly where they stand at this point. We've had a lot of discussions on the RGW side, but I think um, there's not a lot there yet. There are a couple gaps on the um, Cephidium piece still, but working on closing this. I think there's some pretty good progress on CephFS, though. I saw a big pull request merge the other day. OK, good. Yeah, it seems like an area we should focus on frequency to make sure that we're testing things the way we're, same way we're that, that users actually deploy them. Yeah. I get the sense that it'll still be useful to have some stuff that runs outside of Cephadium. Um but um, but having just to verify like the packages still install correctly and and these are all there that, that sort of thing or yeah, and there are a few things that like don't at least currently don't work well with Cephadium, like Valgrind and and right. the, the thrashing mm -hmm. does stuff that I think it, I think some of the thrashing operations well actually I think most of them maybe not. Yeah, I take that back. I think that's that's all fine. Are there other pieces that are missing from the Cephadian test besides uh, a grinder? Be some. Valgrind's one. Um, there's the the Ceph task has some stuff like that do waits, like waiting for um, things to come up that are missing um, from Cephadian. Um, you have to think about it a bit more. I think that the biggest issue um, right now is that um, most of the client workloads require packages to be installed because mm -hmm. you can't run the client workloads inside a container. And even if you could, we don't generate a, con a container that has all of the debug packages um, installed. So um, seems like we would want that anyway to be able to analyze core dumps or uh, inspect running processes more easily anyway. Yeah, I mean, what I usually do is I just I shell into the container and then I, um, you know, DNF install. <laughs> debug info package and then look at the core of it. But yeah, I think making debug containers would be good. I guess converting the client uh, on the um, test themselves to run in containers to not rely on the package installation would be a bit of a larger project, but it would help quite a bit because then we wouldn't need to spend 10, 15 minutes for every job installing packages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Cephidium ones that run without 
packages go a lot faster. Definitely. Um, but again, I think we need to be a little bit careful. We don't want to eliminate all trace of. Yeah, yeah. We still need to test. Yeah. Well, maybe we could potentially put that in like a separate subsuite, though. It doesn't have to be uh, across all uh, all the common jobs. Yeah. So maybe this is related, but we talked about a bit this, this a bit of, um, in the work session yesterday. But I think um, it's time to write a kubeadm task and a rook task for Tuvology that install mm -hmm. Kubernetes and install a rook cluster. That's the only way we're going to make sure that the manager rook integration actually works. And also a rook.py that installs a rook cluster. So, uh, yeah. That may or may not be necessary. It might be that you just have a kubeadm apply that like dumps in a bunch of YAML. So, okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> or maybe the rook task is really simple because it just layers on top. I think a while ago, um, for sure, from the CFFS team was looking at trying to add like a, a mini cube. Running into the logy, I'm not sure how far she got. Yeah, I mean the thing with the thing with Minikube and the minis or whatever is that they are designed to run on one host and they spin up they create virtual machines. Okay. And I'm not sure if that's the model that we. I think there's there's recent support in Minikube for multiple hosts, quote unquote, but that really actually just means multiple virtual machines. Okay. Okay. It's a multi-node cube in multiple VMs. I don't know. How does how does Rook run things in their CI? I. I think it might be Minikube, actually. Not sure. Yeah, yeah maybe it sounds like it might be worth consulting with them if there's a, what's the best way to set up a Kubernetes test environment. Yeah. I guess my sense is that if we if we want to use virtual machines, then instead of allocating a bare metal node and then running Minikube on it, we should instead be have like an open stack pool of machines and allocate virtual machines and then run stuff ADM to install or cube ADM to install Kubernetes on those. Push the virtual machine stuff down one layer. Yeah, you know, what is the virtual machine to um, get you in, the, in that case? Uh, beyond a bare metal machine? I mean, I, I'm saying that if we want to use VMs, then we should just have an open okay. stack or something and use those VMs as opposed to like running Minikube and using them only for Kubernetes or something. Right, right. I just, I just don't see why, why we'd want to use VMs. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we should. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying, if if we did want to go down that route for some reason, then I think it makes more sense to have a generic um, virtualization layer, mm -hmm. not something like Minikube. Okay. Um, and some, we've talked a lot about a lot of other kinds of improvements we could make to the to, to technology, but I think one of the other most impactful ones would be the uh, ability to run technology kind of as an existing cluster, like a, a development environment, like vstart. So you wouldn't have to kick off, build, and wait for packages and schedule uh, runs. You could just uh, run this test directly the same way that, you, that they're run uh, by the suites. Yeah. Yeah. In in my experience, writing topology tasks is really painful because even if you lock 
you lock machines and you're testing, you're like developing your code and you're running the task over and over again. Um, it's really hard to get the nodes to clean up because we mostly rely on like re-imaging nodes. Um, mm -hmm. There isn't a like, a, Nuke doesn't seem to be very thorough, I guess, or it doesn't work. I can't remember. <laughs> it's been a while it's since really, I did this. But... really fallen out of, of uh, thoroughness since we stopped using it regularly. Yeah. yeah. It was always hard to re, re, rerun things. But... Probably whoever tackles the kubeadm task will immediately run into that and have to solve that problem. Why, why would that? Why would kubeadm not be using like the image machines? Just just while you're writing the task, if you're developing the task, oh, I see what you're saying. It's every time you iterate, that's really tedious. Right, right. Um, I guess one other thing I mentioned on this Ethereum part on converting these other suites, um, mm -hmm. I did just add a um, Cephidium dot apply task that you can call. That <clears throat> basically you just feed it YAML, so either the it has like a specs element, and then you have a, a a list of specs you want to apply, or you can, yeah, that's how it works. Um, and so, for the most part, um, you don't really need. It, probably even some of the stuff that's already in stuff ADM could be removed, mm -hmm. um, because anytime you want to like tell stuff ADM to do something for something, you can just write the the spec that gets fed right into the orchestrator right there. Cool. Yeah, that should make it a lot easier to do things with upgrade tasks or more specialized testing. Are there other aspects of this of Cephadian that we're not uh, covering that well? Like maybe, I don't know if we're, do, we're doing much with like drive specs or drive groups? Yeah, we're not using drive specs at all because they don't actually work with the way the technology is set up. Um, those machines have pre existing LVs and which like just barely work with <laughs> stuff ADM. Okay. Uh, so drive groups aren't covered. Um, none of the placement stuff is really covered. Well, like the scheduling things, like we have a bunch of unit tests that we rely on for that, but. Um... Yeah, that's not, that's sort of missing and. Um... I guess for the the work around the scheduling, like for resource allocation, um, that would I would if they want to be able to test that. Yeah, yeah, we haven't that hasn't merged yet, so we haven't really right, really right. The testing part of it, but yeah. Um. Okay, well, I think that's uh, plenty of thing, plenty of areas that we can um, iterate on. All right, Sebastian, I see you're you're around as well. Um, are there more uh, gaps for Cephadium? Do you think um, we should list here? Uh, you're muted. Give me ten seconds to to uh, read through the other path. Sure, no problem. Uh, you know, maybe actually, maybe on the Pulpito side, one of the um, sort of headaches that we keep bumping up against is um, the way that containers are built. Um, it's just very fragile right now. Um, and it's not very, the way that things are surfaced in Pulpito, like you have to know that it's the x86 CentOS package build that also builds a container at the very end. Um, but there's like no whatever. It's yeah, it's, it's just hard to see what's going on and it it keeps breaking. Do you mean um, do you mean like you mean shaman where you were you're seeing whether yeah, the builds shaman. are complete? Yeah, sorry, shaman, not Pulpito, yeah. Um Yeah, that's a good point. Um 
if we're going to add like uh, a debug container, um, that might be something we want to show there. <clears throat> One other thought I had though is like, I wonder if, I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not, but I wonder if we want to have a build process that builds directly to a container instead of building packages and then installing them in the container. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a lot faster. Like we would probably save a half hour, <laughs> like skipping the intermediate package step. Yeah. Um, but, can can we? I don't know. Related to to skipping the packages, can we move the Docker files into the Ceph tree? Uh, because Ceph container into the Ceph tree itself, because Ceph container is overly complicated, needlessly complicated, and replicates um, the different Ceph version that we already have branches for in the Ceph tree. So just by by moving things over to the Ceph tree, um, I think 90% of the uh, intricacies of Ceph container are just going to vanish into, into a void. Yeah, maybe. That, that's a, a deeper discussion that probably needs one of the stuff container folks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My sense is that the, the container gets revised even for past um, stuff versions. Yes. So that's partly why like we rebuild, we'll go and rebuild old containers when there are security issues or whatever. Base images update. So. Yeah, we could uh, discuss more about the container build process with um, Guillaume and Dimitri uh, when they're back. Um, yeah. And when we, when we do encounter error, errors in stuff container, it can be difficult to figure out what's wrong. Um, regarding stuff, I mean, there are a lot more gaps that we have in, in, in the testing. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention AHA, but it's about to be like redone a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah, like NFS, I want to make sure that, well, yeah. So I think once the, um, the HA stuff is fixed up, then it'd be a good time to add a bunch of testing there or like active, active NFS and active passive NFS and um the whatever HA in front of RGW and so on. Make sure all that stuff works. Yeah. Right right now we are kind of deploying things, but we have no idea if the demons that we are deploying actually properly work. Yeah. So they they can can fail and, and still running. Um like they can't access things or I don't know. And we never know. My sense is that the way to address that is to have in the Ceph ADM portion of the suite, we like deploy the daemon and do just like a read and write a file, something like a really simple, just to make sure it had like a smoke test. Yes. And then also go and update the actual NFS RGW portion of the RGW test suite and make it use Ceph ADM to deploy instead of deploying whatever. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to have every, the. it doesn't make sense to test NFS in the Ceph ADM suite, right? Um, but we have to make sure that at least it, it works. It works, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just got it, for example. The only workload we have right now are the API tests and the Python tests. Mm, that, that everything is just deployed. I think that we cannot properly test placements in um, in Perturbity because it's 
the, the, the testing metrics that you need to do in order to test, test placements is just too big. I think we have to mainly rely on unit tests when testing the placements. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think actually that, that works pretty well. Mm. Uh, downgrades. We need to test downgrades with Cephidium. Oh, God. Yeah. We need to test downgrades, period. I mean, we keep saying that, like, this next release is the one where we're going to have a downgrade suite. Um, I think Quincy is, or no, Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem with downgrades is that we have, if you're in between upgrading the managers and you're doing a failover, then you already are doing a downgrade. So users, uh, if you really have to avoid failovers, if you are in between um, the manager upgrades. Otherwise, you end up in a downgrade situation. Yep. And that's super bad. Yeah. I think we just, yeah. I think we should decide with Pacific that we're going to allow downgrades to point releases. Yeah, but we have to test it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It means that if we have any sort of like... Um, Instance where this, this, the manager Cephidia module, for example, is rewriting its stored state based on the upgrade, it needs to do that in a backward, forward compatible way, whatever it is. Yeah, either fail gracefully or, uh, or work. Yeah. Yeah, on the bright side, Cephidia does simplify testing that grades quite a bit. Because uh, we don't no longer have to worry about crazy container de or uh, package dependencies issues. So yeah. That yeah, simplifies it, things it a lot. It works, quote unquote, right now. Would the existing upgrade um, path in Cephidium be, be the one to use to do a downgrade as well? Or? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's it's basically already implemented. I added a bunch of checks to, to, to prevent you from downgrading major versions. I can't remember if I put something in to prevent you downgrading minor versions initially with the expectation that we'd remove it when we're ready. I can't remember. I didn't mm -hmm. it. I, I'm guessing not. I, I'm guessing that the minor version downgrades work right now. So, yeah, it sounds like we should start, start trying, to, trying to make a, a kind of Pacific point to point downgrade suite. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so one thing managers. related to the downgrades, so, sorry, um, one thing related to the downgrades, we have been intro introducing these feature flags in point releases, um, in past releases. So if at all we have to do that for a Pacific release, um, will there be like a, a matrix you cannot downgrade from this version to that version? Um, that kind of stuff. If if we need to, <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm not saying we will, to, but guess, yeah. <laughs> every yeah. time there's something that comes up, but yeah, yeah. hopefully we don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking about this. Like, it might be that um, we decide that there's a floor. Like, we had a critical change that we made in like dot five or something, and so you can't again grow it from dot five. Yeah, so yeah. But the um, So the manager could enforce that. Like if it's a 0.5 manager, then it doesn't let you downgrade any lower than .5. Um, but that would that would not work if, um, as of .5, we decide you can't downgrade below .2, because you could always download to like .4, and then .4 didn't know that it can't downgrade below .2. But mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Yeah, who knows? Um, I think we'll see what comes along. Uh, I think we just start by um, upgrading. Upgrade change. If upgrade chains, if you're if you're trying to upgrade from fifteen to zero, you cannot upgrade to sixteen because um, there is no Potman version that is compatible to fifteen. Yeah. One and sixteen. 
it, it's just impossible to upgrade in one go because you just can't uh, properly run the upgrade from one to the other. Um, so is there a need to first upgrade from 15 to 0 to, to the latest Octopus release? Um, upgrade Podman and then upgrade to uh, to Pacific? Is that something that's yes. feasible? Like we should put that in the release notes. I just realized that the upgrades for Cephidium doesn't mention that. You have to be running. If you're upgrading with Cephidium from Octopus, you need to be running the latest Octopus first and to yeah. check your Podman version. You should add that. Should that be something that we were encoding in the um, kind of upgrade itself, or we always like upgrade upgrading to like the latest stable release version before upgrading the, the next major? Um, uh, I don't know. Well, it's a little bit hard because you don't know what for the if you're running 15.2.0, it doesn't. At the time it was released, we didn't know what the future upgrade constraints were going to be. Right, right. Um, but that said, um, we we were just talking in the earlier session about um, adding an upgrade, Cephorch upgrade list or check or something like that that lets you, that will just query upstream to like see what versions are available. Mm -hmm. And probably an option that just like is just upgrade to the latest without thinking about it, um, whatever it might be. And the I think the way to do that is to publish um, like a JSON or YAML file somewhere that enumerates the versions um, so that we don't like have to query a registry or something like that, which doesn't always work. And if we do that, then a logical thing to do there would be to like be able to mark certain versions as toxic. Like if there's a, a do not install this version, it's bad. <laughs> like we want to mark that. And so people can see that sort of flag. And um, if we're doing all that, then that might also be a place where we um, somehow encode any upgrade constraints. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, maybe getting ahead of ourselves there. Yeah, yeah, that's like that. I could use a separate discussion, maybe. I think we're about out of time for this one. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, in fact, we are out of time. So I think we've got to switch over to RBD now. Thanks, folks.